All right, we're going to go to Hebrews 11. Remember, fresh review, that this is a chapter on the heroes of faith. A lot we can glean here. Recall that because this is a transitional book, that the background, if Paul is the author, that he's covering a lot of tribulation doctrine for the Jews because it's addressed to Hebrews. However, because the doctrine of the church is being introduced, there is a mingling of Christian and tribulation Jewish doctrine. In Hebrews 11, we can apply that universally because a lot of its devotional, practical, spiritual applications can apply both to tribulation saint and to a Christian. Now, I will make some distinctions toward a tribulation saint when, as we undergo Hebrews 11, but we can take it for granted that as we go through this chapter that you can apply it to yourself. So, with that being said, let's see other verses in Hebrews 11 that we can apply to ourselves and learn as well as the tribulation saint. They can apply it. And if there's a, a different distinction, something that's more emphatic toward the tribulation saint, I will be sure to mention that. Hebrews chapter 11, and we left off at verse 12. Uh, verse 12. Recall that this is referring to Sarah at verse 11, that through her faith she was able to bring forth a child, give birth to a child, and in verse 12, the result, therefore sprang there even of one, and him as good as dead. So what came out of Sarah was one particular child whose name is Isaac, and he might as well as, as uh, might have been good as dead. Because of one, Sarah, she was past age. She was so much up in years, so her womb was pretty much practically dead. The second thing is because Isaac would have died sometime in the future, and we're going to study that a little bit more, where Abraham was tested by God to offer Isaac as a sacrifice. Now remember, I'm going to explain each and every word here, which is why I'm giving these kind of explanations or this type of commentary. So many as the stars of the sky in multitude, and as the sand which is by the seashore innumerable meaning that the seed that would come out of Sarah, which is the one Isaac, he will give birth to, he will have many generations after him. Her seed will be so big, it will be as innumerable, something you cannot count, so much in large multitudes, as large as the stars of the sky, and as the sand which is by the seashore. When we look at verse 13, these all died in faith, not having received the promises. Now that's an important note where you can apply it to yourself that all these heroes of faith did not receive the promises yet. Yeah. So we've seen that case with Sarah. All she had was a child named Isaac, but she did not see that her seed is innumerable. We've talked about Abraham. He was not able to see that city, that location that God promised to his seed where he would have basically the kingdom of heaven. We're going to see that later, which is God's kingdom on earth for the nation of Israel that will occur during the time of the millennium. So some of these heroes of faith, they died believing, even though they did not see it, even though it did not happen in their lifetime, they still believed and died in faith. But having seen them afar off and were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth, meaning that even though they did not receive it, they did not see it, they seen them ahead of time. Okay? So when you're looking... You're not supposed to be looking at the now. You're supposed to be looking at the future. 
which is the heavenly things, right? So we have to be looking at what God promised ahead of time, not currently. Yeah. That's the problem with human flesh is we want it now, 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 now. But the problem with now is when you get it now, then it's gone. Even though you don't have it now, you do have it later, and it's permanent. Yeah. So you always have to look at that. You want something that will last forever, something that will stick with you for life, not something where it's gone, and you have to search for another one on. to satisfy yourself in now, 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 now. That's a troubling thing with now. That's a mentally stressful life. It's a, a life will, where you'll never attain permanent happiness but ever searching for happiness. So you're drowning yourself in the now, it's gone, then you have to find something else for the now to make yourself happy, and on and on the ever, journey, uh, the ever search goes. Never ending story. They were very persuaded of those promises. They believed it fully that it will happen. Fully so much that they embraced it. They held on to it with everything that they've got. They're not going to let it go. And they admitted to this earth, to the people in this world, who are po probably poking fun at them. Well, you're not happy right now. I don't see God blessing you right now. I don't see God working in your life. How could you believe that the Lord will be good to you, that he'll give you joy, that he will bless your life, because I don't see it right now. And they will admit to that earth that, yes, in now on this earth, while I'm walking on this earth, I'm, this is not my home. This is not where I have a permanent home, permanent future for my happiness. Yeah. See that? I'm just a stranger here. I'm just a pilgrim. Yes, this world is not my home, as the song goes, I'm just passing through. So we confess it to the world. If they poke fun at you, confess it to them, you're right the Christian life, and we're going to see right here later on, living for God is not something where it's all uh, dandelions and all full of joy and smiles like you saw from liars on TV who s keep smiling at you and try to make you think that Christianity is that kind of a life. No, it's not prosperity gospel. It's okay to confess it. It's okay to confess to the world, you're right, it's not easy to be a Christian. You're right. I'm not feeling well. You're right, I'm unhappy today. Yeah. You're right, I'm miserable. Who would have thought, right? Yeah, you can confess that. Because why? In this world, I'm just a stranger and I'm a pilgrim. But I know that sometime in the future, it's for my betterment. Anything, even the now things of life, there are things in the now life that require uh, sometimes time. If you want the degree, it'll take years of stress and misery to get the degree you want. In the job place, you want something where you get a higher pay or a better position or the things that the goals that you want to attain in the workplace, you do have to go through miserable things to get what you want. In life, even the drug addict will have to go through misery to get what he wants. Yeah. Sinners, they'll have to go through misery to get what they want. We're just more honest than them. Right. See, so we confess it, but those people don't. They want to pretend those things don't exist. So it's okay to confess it, because this world is not our home. For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they might have had opportunity to have return, but now they desire a better country that is and heavenly. Okay, so in other words, remember I'm going to be explaining every word here. So when we confess that, yeah, I am miserable here, I'm not seeking a permanent happy life on this earth because all I am is just a homeless guy who's a wanderer. So I'm a wanderer, I'm a stranger, this is, I'm not really seeking for permanent stability as a citizen here. I'm just a wanderer going from place to place. 
And when you say that kind of a stuff, you are declaring plainly, you're confessing clearly at the same time that I'm seeking for something better. Yes. I have a better thing in mind. I have a better goal. I have a much more happy attainment than what you guys are going through. So when I'm saying I'm miserable here, that means that I'm seeking for something better. Does that make any sense? So when you're saying and confessing to them you're miserable, that shouldn't make you think, oh, I'm miserable forever. Right, right. See, that's what your flesh is convinced of thinking. When, I, when you say you're miserable, you just convinced yourself you're miserable and you're going to die miserable. No, that's not what it means. When you say you're miserable, that's a, there's a positive thing behind that. That means that this life is the worst hell you're ever going to get then. Yes, what you're yes. experiencing now is the worst you're ever going to experience. That's it. Yes. So we expect things to get better. We expect uh, great things in life that will happen to us. Thank God for that. Yes. So we're declaring, confessing plainly that we want a better country. Yes. We want a better location and home to reside. And the home that we desire, the better country that we want, is the, obviously the heavenly. So that's what we're looking at for our future. So that's the explanation to verse 14 and 16. For verse, for verse 15, the verse is saying, uh, for, cert for certainly if uh, th their minds were occupied on this earth, see that now, now, the here and now, then uh, that place where they came out, which you and I are not of the world, right? We're not of the world. If we're mindful of the earth that we're living in, that we're no longer a part of, then we would have received and taken the chance of any opportunity to go back to that lifestyle. See, so these are very good verses. 13, 14, 15, 16 should be memorized by any person whose flesh is longing and coveting after the wicked world. Okay? These are very good verses for you to keep in mind. We, we realize so many chances we could have had to sin, right? So many opportunities we felt like that we lost oh you know why didn't i go to that high school prom you know because mom and dad says that it's not a good testimony for a christian whatever oh, i lost my high school memories now precious memories and you see what that devil does what the flesh in the world does oh i should have chased after that job opportunity but because of what i sacrificed for the lord i'll never get that now so I'll never get it again, and I'll never have another chance or open door. See, that's what the devil does. Yeah. But if we always long for the now country, then we would have had an opportunity to return to it. So why didn't we? Right. All of you have that chance now. God is not the one who made you miserable. You made the choice yourself yeah. to take upon this miserable, wayfaring, stranger and pilgrim life. Why? Because you made the decision that I'm going to trust you, God. See, I have faith. I'm going to embrace it, as verse 13 says. And even if I don't see it in my lifetime and I'll, I don't receive the promise in this lifetime, I know I'm going to get it afterwards. Yeah. That kind of a faith and strong belief that you embrace and cling on to all the way to the end, that is some faith. Yeah. And that is something that you can show off to the world and even confess to them. So it's okay to confess your misery to them. Remember that. It's okay. It's okay to confess that, yeah, you guys got it better than me. Why? Because what you're confessing at the same time is, I got something better than you. Okay, so remember that. That's the whole bottom line. That's why I like the last part of verse 16, which is what you and I want. What you and I want is actually not even the future promises of God, not even the future happiness of future blessings, the better things 
that we're going to attain more than the here and now on this earth. What we want more is the last part of verse 16. Wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. So in other words, this is why, due to their desire for the right things, God is not ashamed to say, yes, I am your God. Yes, these are my children who worship me. Yes, these are my Bible-believing Christians. These are the real Bible believers. Imagine God not being ashamed about that and showing that off to the world. Now, I wonder at the judgment seat of Christ if God won't be ashamed of you. There's so many people who are afraid of the shame at the judgment seat of Christ, but it's another thing if God is ashamed of you, not just you being ashamed. See, that's, uh, like I told you before, that's the one we probably want the most, is that God to be proud of us at the end. That's what the last part of verse 16 says. That's what we want more than the gold, silver, precious stones, and the better things in life. So, that's why verse 13 through 16, I strongly believe you should memorize it for those, if you struggle going through hard times in this world. That's the reason why God prepared for those types of people who always look at the heaven and, who always look at the heavenly a city. So we see right here heaven that God hath prepared for us, and then on the earth at the millennium, He literally gives us cities to rule. But if you don't live for Him, if you keep looking at the here and now, then you lose such rewards, status in the heavenly city as well as in the millennium, literally, cities to own and rule. Why? Because of your here and now of, what, a better condo? That's fancy on some 10th tenth, tenth floor that overlooks the whole city? Are you kidding me? What about a whole city? Yeah. So remember, that's what we're looking forward to, and we believe in that very strongly. Yes, we are fanatics. And yeah, you, for those idiots on Reddits and on what, Quora or something like that, that says, what do you think about Real Bible Believers channel? That channel name is already a red flag. Sounds like some extremist. And yeah, you're right. I am an extremist because I believe in that very strongly. I'm for real, but I guess you guys don't like something real. So that's a red flag? Keep enjoying your fake life. Then. Yeah. Don't believe that book. Now, there's a lot of great verses that we're going to glean from on these passages. So let's start off with 1 Peter chapter 2 Amen. and then Ephesians 2. 1 Peter chapter 2 and Ephesians 2. We might park it here a little bit, actually, because there's a lot of good verses to glean here. All right, we're going to look at 1 Peter chapter 2, and then we'll also look at Ephesians 2. We admit it, we are strangers and pilgrims on this earth. We admit it that uh, living for God in this life won't mean that we'll have a lot of good things. Okay, so look at 1 Peter chapter 2. Notice that our life in this earth is not really much what we would expect when we look at verse 11. Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims. See? So matching Hebrews 11. We are strangers and pilgrims. Because that's your status, and we don't think that. See? You know why you always get upset at God or you always get sad in life? Because you think this world's your home. So when things don't meet up your expectation with your goals you have on this earth, what happens to you? You get upset. You get bitter, you get mad. Yeah, that's us. So what if your expectations are let down? You forgot your status? You're not a resident here. Amen. So don't expect expectations here because this is not your home. What you are, remember, verse 11 says, because you're strangers and pilgrims, if that's your status, what should you expect? This is what you should expect. Not to satisfy your flesh, but to abstain from fleshly lusts, which war against the soul. You know what that means? You should expect things to go against your fleshly expectation. Comprende? 
If you have that, you're going to be much happier in your Christian life. You know why you're not happy? You're seeking happiness on this earth. You're not seeking happiness from above. Now, when you go to Ephesians 2, I'll tell you what you're a citizen of, a resident of. You know who are strangers and pilgrims in reality? Not us, believe it or not. It's those lost people. You know why? Those people are strangers, foreigners, basically illegals, illegal immigrants who try to invade heaven their own way, who try to create heaven in their own way, humanitarianism. And God, in his great wrath, he's not going to, let me open my borders and let you in. No, he will damn them with hellfire. Okay? Look at uh, Ephesians 2.12. That the time you were without Christ. See that? Uh -huh. Being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise. Mm -hmm. But we are not that. What are we? In verse 19. Now, therefore, ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. Yeah. So if this is what you're a citizen of, then uh, why are you sad about your citizenship not working well down here? Okay, this is where you're a citizen of, and that's what you and I would prefer. We want to be a citizen over here. But then uh, down here, we want no part in that. In this earth, we will always remain as strangers and pilgrims. But there are Christians who, are tr who want both, right? They want to be citizens and friends up above and below. That's a dangerous thing with Christians nowadays, and God doesn't want that. Okay, we're going to look at uh, John 17, and then I want you to go to Colossians 3. John 17 and Colossians 3. This world is not my home, I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up. See? Somewhere beyond the blue. So Colossians 3, set your affections on things above, not on things on this earth. What are you setting your affection on? You know what affection means? Your desire. What did 1 Peter 2 remind you? As strangers and pilgrims, abstain from what? The fleshly affections. Yeah. Ephesians 3, I mean, excuse me, Colossians 3, 2, set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. I like verse 3. It's more plain. It's more mean than 1 Peter 2. Uh, more mean than 1 Peter chapter 2. You're not just a stranger and pilgrim. You're dead. That's good. Yeah. You know what a dead man has? No rights, no claims, possesses nothing. Yeah. So, uh, you have to see that way with your life. Yeah. But see, you possess and you own too much. You know why? You're an America, American citizen. That's your problem. All right, go to John 17. The American's consumer desire will never end when they always have that in mind, that I am a citizen here. Go to John 17. John chapter 17. And you wonder why Bible believers back in the past, those Moravians and these guys were willing to become slaves yeah. just to and disown their homes, separate from family, lose everything, possess nothing, just to win other souls salvation. You know why? Because they realized they own nothing on this earth. Yeah. They really believe that. Go to John 17. Notice that in verse 16, what did Jesus say? Jesus says, they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. So we have to realize that we are not of this world, and we should know we should not be friends with the world. But verse 9, we have to keep this in mind. Jesus says, I pray for them, I pray not for the world. That's very good. So we have to realize that we got Jesus Christ praying on our behalf as we're going through, through this world as strangers and pilgrims. Yeah. But Jesus ain't praying for the citizens of this earth. So he ain't praying for them. But um, in my sermon, uh, God and the world don't mix, our problem is we do pray for the world, like I told you. Uh, 
Our problem is we're the ones that are praying for the world. No wonder preachers are starting to pray for the world now, getting more ecumenical. Why? They want to settle down. Come on. Yeah, they'll preach. I, I, that's why I kicked those guys very, very hard. They produced a worldly mindedness amongst all of our Christian listeners now. Okay, now let's go to Hebrews uh, 11 again. And let me emphasize the doctrinal part. Didn't you know doctrinally as well that these tribulation Jews, which is obvious that they're strangers and pilgrims on this earth, they disown, they lose everything because they're not part of the mark of the beast system. So the Holy Spirit, he mentions over here that throughout the time of the Old Testament, these Old Testament heroes who are Jews are like those tribulation Jews. Hey, don't worry. They didn't own anything either. And they're strangers and pilgrims. As a matter of fact, even God himself is a stranger and a pilgrim on this earth. So uh, the evidence we're going to see go to Psalm, uh, go to Psalm 39. Psalm 39. I like this one. This is a good verse to memorize too. I like this one. So if you feel miserable or you're going through this world, like just going through it, right? As a pilgrim and a stranger, just going through the phases in life. It's just another same old, same old. Remember this, you're not alone. God is with you. Oh, the Psalm 39, 12. I like this verse. This is what the psalmist confessed when he's, going, when he's dragging on with the things of life as a stranger and a pilgrim. Verse 12. Hear my prayer, O Lord, and give ear unto my cry. Hold not thy peace at my tears, for I am a stranger with thee and a sojourner as all my fathers were. Ain't that good? Mm -hmm. That's a great verse. Yes, Lord, I'm just going through the same old, same old with you. Right. You and I are going That's through true. these things together. You know that? You know that? Because remember, Jesus Christ is in you. Yes. At the same time, he's feeling what you're feeling. If we look back at Acts 9, Saul was persecuting Christians, and Jesus said, you're persecuting me. Yep. The Bible did say that uh, whatever you're grieved within, the Holy Spirit uh, can uh, be grieved and be empathetic, can fe be touched with the feeling of your infirmities. Yeah. What does that show? An emotional connection with your emotions oh, right. taking place. Yeah. So we realize that, Lord, we're going through it together. Right. When they mock you, when they disown you, and you're just walking through life, you're just saying, Lord, I'm just a stranger with you. And that's a comfort, man. That's a great verse. Behold, I am a stranger with thee. Notice in uh, Leviticus 25, Leviticus 25. And then go to 2 Samuel 7. Leviticus 25 and 2 Samuel chapter 7. You ever wondered why God told David that uh, he didn't want him to build him a temple? You ever wondered why God told those Jews to, when they were making him a home that it's not going to be some kind of fancy palace? You ever wondered why? The simple answer is because God mm, on, wants to be a stranger with them. That's right. That's good. Now, would you believe that? God who owns and created the whole universe, but he wants to be with you yeah. where he wants to not settle down with the world. You wonder why Jesus said, I don't pray for the world. Right. You wonder why God is very anti-worldly. Now you know why. Yeah. Because his whole life, no matter what dispensation, he wanted to try to live that way. How about that one, right? Out of every dispensation, Amen. he wanted to live that way. That's why in the millennium, he's going to straighten it all out. That would be the exception. Yeah. But uh, the, the Lord God Almighty wants to be in line with you, being a stranger and a pilgrim, which is why 
he went through these following things. He went through the wanderings of the wilderness in that tabernacle. We see that first case in Leviticus. Go to Leviticus 23. Uh, yeah, uh, it's actually 25, sorry. Yeah, 25, 23. That's what I meant, 25, 23, sorry. The Bible says, The land shall not be sold forever, for the land is mine, for ye are strangers and sojourners. What? With me. Uh, how about that? How about that, right? So even though the Lord God Almighty says, Hey, this land is mine, and he is the one who created everything. All should belong to him. He wants to stay as the status of a wanderer with you, a stranger and a sojourner. We're in this together. When you're wandering in the wilderness 40 years, yes. I'm going along through it with you. When you're going through the hard times, I'm going along with you. Amen. Now, you got to realize that our bitterness toward God is truly unjustified yes, because um, you got to realize how much hardship God is going through with you. That's right. Now, if, uh, if you ever taken care of children or if you ever counsel people, or mentor people through drug addictions. Do you know what it's like going through the struggles with them? Yeah, yeah you're right, preacher. Come on. Oh, so your life is tough? You drug addict? Your life is tough? You, uh, you kid or you church member, etc.? You think your life is tough? You ever tried uh, being along with them, helping them out, staying with them? What about one million Jews? What about every saved believer around the world? What about billions throughout all the previous dispensations? The, your bitterness is not justified. It's extremely selfish. Yep. Amen. 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 6. The Bible says, Wherefore have I not dwelt in any house since the time that I brought up the children of Israel out of Egypt, even to this day, but have walked in a tent and in a tabernacle? That's what God told David. When David said, why can't I build you a home? And God's like, I've always been a wanderer, David. That's not me. Man, man, that's good. But if it was you and me, we'd say, yeah, build me a house. <laughs> yeah. You ever turn down a gift like that? Wow, that's something to think and pray about. You ever turn down a gift like that? God did. Why? It's not me, he said. See, he realized who he really is. You don't. You and I don't. Yeah, good stuff. Amen. All right. Uh, Genesis 20. Genesis chapter 20. So, doctrinally, we've seen in the book of Hebrews that these Old Testament saints... They could have went back to their home, which is Abraham, to the Ur, Ur of Ch Chaldees, but he did it. He took by faith that what kingdom God is going to give to him, a better home that God's going to give to him, even though he didn't see it in his lifetime, that he was going to get it. So in the meantime, he's still a sojourner and a pilgrim. Go to the book of Genesis, chapter 20, and verse 13. The Bible says, and it came to pass when God caused me to wander from my father's house that I said unto her, This is thy kindness which thou shalt show unto me at every place whither we shall come. Say of me, he is my brother. Now this is a good verse to glean something here. One, it is a statement that is not true, but also true. So the truthful side is that Abraham knows that he's, he's a wanderer. So he is not a citizen in this land. So he admitted that to Abimelech. But we see right here something that's untrue. The untrue part right here is we see that Abraham said, God's the one who caused me to wander. <laughs> now how's that a hero of the faith? He went by faith 
and believe. Yes, Lord, I believe in the promise, even though I'm not going to see it. And he left his father's house. But sometime during his Christian walk with God, when something bad happened to him, some trial happened to him, and he sinned and messed up, then he goes, God's the one, you know, well, if God didn't tell me to do this, I sacrificed much for the Lord because of that. That's why I had so much pressure and stress, and so that's why I sinned and... Come on. <laughs> God caused me to wander. No. See that? So when we're going through our wandering as believers, we tend to use that as our excuse to sin, right? Just like those Jews who are wandering in the wilderness. Yeah. So we can use that as our excuse to keep complaining, I guess. To keep sinning, I guess. To fall into fornication with the Moabites, I guess. Am I preaching or is this, they have so much application to us. There's so much we can learn right here. Are you giving the same statement like Abraham did? I'll, I'm guilty. I did that a few times. I'm sure you did too. Mm -hmm. But that should never be the statement. Amen. God caused me to wander. Is that what you're doing right now? How about God's statement when he's offered the world and he said, no, that's not for me. I've always wandered. I've always been that type. All right, go to Hebrews 11. Man, so much good stuff to learn here in Hebrews 11 on the chapters of faith. Amen. So much great stuff. The last doctrinal thing that I want to mention is you'll notice that from verse 12 through 16, I was concentrating so much for our case on the heavenly, right? But you'll notice when I talked about Abraham, and then Sarah and these other Old Testament saints, when they were looking forward to God's promise, this one is actually referring to the millennial kingdom for Jerusalem. So it's not up here in heaven. You're going to see commentators try to point this heavenly thing is referring to here up in heaven. For us, we can do that. But for Abraham, that is not the case. This is referring to his... Jerusalem Millennial Kingdom, right here. So that's the Millennial Kingdom. That's his citizenship. That's the one he's looking forward to. They never had it for 6,000 years. He's going to get it. Now, how do we know this? Because it seems contradictory when we look at that last verse we looked at. It said heavenly, right? It didn't say earthly, but the Millennium Kingdom is earthly. Well, it's called kingdom of heaven. Yeah. So Matthew 11, Matthew 11. This millennial kingdom is heavenly. Why? Because in a sense, this is God's kingdom. That's not worldly. That's not earthly, but it will be on the earth, yeah. if that makes any sense yeah. to you. Because God's building it. All right, go to Matthew 11. Notice Matthew 11 says kingdom of heaven but when it says kingdom of heaven, this is definitely not the one up in the third heaven. Right. This is something on the earth, a physical, literal kingdom, yeah. which is going to be the millennium for the Jews. Yeah. Go to the book of Matthew chapter 11. Notice what Jesus said at verse 11. Uh, excuse me, not that one. Uh, verse 12, and from the days, verse 12, and from the days of John the Baptist until now. The kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. Why? Well, obviously, that's not up in heaven. Heaven is perfect. But here on earth, there is, has been plenty of violence with the Roman Empire during Jesus' time, the Jews where they did their Maccabean revolt, and then Alexander the Great. He was slaughtering so much violence, kingdom after kingdom. So during throughout that whole time, the nation of Israel always went through violent stages under these empires. That's why they were waiting for their earthly messianic king during Jesus' time. They would have gotten it, but they rejected their Messiah, you might recall. So that was the heavenly kingdom that Abram was looking at. But there are several more evidences when you look at Hebrews 11. How we know this is referring to the kingdom for the Jews, that messianic kingdom on the earth, is because we see right here 
in verse 9, by faith he sojourned, okay, verse 9, he sojourned in the what? Land of promise. So that land was not his home, see that? He's a wanderer, but that land was still going to be his home that God promised him, which he did not receive now, but will in the future. See, that, that is no doubt the messianic kingdom. And we also see that this is, yes, so that's a uh, good one right there in verse 10, right? Builder and maker is God. But another one also is when you look at uh, verse 13. When you look at verse 13, these all died in faith, not having received the promises, but what? Having seen them afar off. So notice right here that they were, that this is something that they're looking ahead. Yeah. If verse 13, the sequence is as follows, that they died, so they already died. But notice they're still looking forward to it. If they die, then uh, they should have been already in their blissful paradise, if that's what they were looking forward to. But if verse 13 is showing a sequence right here, notice that even though after they died in verse 13, they're still anticipating, looking forward to it. They have not yet received the promise. And by the way, at... Uh, Verse 12 and verse 13, it has not been quite fulfilled yet, obviously. It has not been quite fulfilled yet. When we look at now verse 17, verse 17, we will continue on here. Uh, let's see here. By faith, Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac, and he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son. So Abraham had faith when he was tested by God, when he was, going, when he was offering up Isaac, his son, as a sacrifice. And he's identified with the one who received the promises. So I like how this verse points out that the verse or the Lord already sees him as one who already received the promises. Mm -hmm. But even though he did not, at verse 13, not having received the promises. Uh, one explanation, which is very easy, is because God is not bound by time. Mm -hmm. So he could see Abraham already in the future receiving the promise, but even uh, in the present, the actual present on the earth, he doesn't receive the promise. Another explanation is that uh, when you cling on to the promise of God, even though you have not visibly or tangibly received it, in a sense, we're already in it. And the reason why is because a part of us, which is our spirit, is already up in heaven. Mm -hmm. And it, we already know that verse, Ephesians chapter 2 points out that a part of us is already up in heaven with God. It's already enjoying heaven. Revelation chapter 2 and 3 says you already have a crown, even though you're not having the crown now. The verse is saying hold on to it so that no one takes it or steals it from you. That means you already have it. That's the reason why Revelation 1 and 1 Peter, I think, was it 2, points out, that when you get saved, God automatically calls you kings. So that's something. That's really something. So already you own it. Already you have it uh, spiritually until your body dies and your soul gets up there. Then you can see it tangibly and visibly. You can hold on to it. When we also keep reading onwards here, at uh, verse 17, the last part says that he, he's the one that's identified as one who received the promises. He was offering up his only begotten son, a typology of Jesus Christ. There are two things that we can notice right here. We're going to first look at the trying that matches with the temptation, as well as uh, the typology of Jesus Christ. So uh, when we go to this verse, 
This is the answer you want to use where God does not tempt people to sin. There are going to be atheists who will say, well, notice right here, God, will, God tempted people to sin. That contradicted James 1. So go to the book of Genesis. Go to the book of Genesis. So the skeptics, what they would love to do is that they would like to try to point out to you that God's the type of person who would tempt people to sin. Uh, no, James 1 says that God doesn't. Well, then notice right here, God tempted Abraham. But no, it's actually within the lines of Hebrews 11 where God was testing, trying Abraham. So go to the book of Genesis, and then we'll look at the book of chapter 22. Let's see, 22. Genesis 22. Notice in verse 1, oh, here's a problem. And it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham. See? So, I thought that God cannot be tempted be with evil, neither tempteth he any man, as James 1 said. So, what's, what's the meaning here? Well, they didn't really look at James 1. Go to James 1. James 1 already defined to you that temptation could be in the same uh, line with trying and testing as well. Not just going through temptation of sin. Go to the book of James. Chapter 1. So the answer was already given at Hebrews 11, right? So in Hebrews 11, we saw the answer that tempt also means to try. So when God tempted Abraham... It has nothing to do with sin, but rather testing. All right, let's go to James chapter 1. Notice in verse 3, the verse says that, uh, that the trying of your faith, see that? Look at verse 2. My, jo uh, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into divers, what? Temptations, come on. And then he explains, knowing this, at the trying of your faith. Yeah, well, were they reading that? No, they weren't reading that. Look at verse 12. 12 is way more plain. 12 is way more plain. Notice verse 12. Uh, Blessed is a man that endureth temptation, for when he is what? Try. So James admitted, in this first 12 verses, God tries out people. But then I guess he contradicts himself at the very next ver verse 13. God doesn't tempt people. That's stupid unless James is pointing out to you two different things here with temptation. The whole topic's about temptation. So he's talking about trying a faith, but as well as going through temptations with sin. It's that simple. All right. Now go back to Hebrews 11. It has nothing to do with sin. It has to do with testing. James admitted God tries and God tempts you in the sense that he's trying you. Yeah. But I guess he's so stupid, God doesn't tempt you with sin. Unless he's talking about God tempts you and trying you, but he doesn't tempt you to sin. Maybe that's what he meant. Duh. So he just gave you the answer, all right? Uh, take it to an atheist who doesn't read his Bible to tell you what the Bible says about contradictions. That's laughable. That's laughable. If you fall for an atheist telling you what he thinks the Bible says when he didn't read what the Bible says, then you, you, you're a fool too. You're just as stupid as an atheist and you deserve to be called a fool. All right, go to Hebrews 11. Yeah, that was a mean way to say it, but that's the truth, okay? Yeah. Go to Hebrews 11. Maybe you ought to read your Bible more after that, right? Now, the second part is the Christology at verse 17. In other words, we want to look at the typology of Jesus Christ. Uh, you'll see from the board right here that Isaac perfectly pictures Jesus Christ. And then I want you to go to John 8. And then John 3. John 8 and John 3. John 8 and John 3, and then go back to Hebrews 11. I'm going to show you 
that even the author himself of the book of Hebrews admitted and told you that Isaac is actually a figure. He's a typology. So first start off with Hebrews chapter 11. Notice the author of Hebrews, there's no doubt that he's trying to point out Isaac is a type of Christ. When he says at verse 18, of whom, that's Isaac, it was said that in Isaac shall thy seed be called. So the Holy Spirit's pointing out that Isaac was referred to in the word of God that through Isaac, his seed will be called out. Now, uh, this one, if you're wondering the verse that uh, he's referring to, it's going to be referring to the book of Genesis. Uh, I know that your hand's already in four places, sorry, but if you want to write the cross-reference to that one, it's going to be Genesis chapter uh, 22, as well as the book of Genesis. Let's see, it's when he was talking to Abraham about Ishmael. Genesis 21 and Genesis 22. It'll be Genesis 21, Genesis 22, and then one more chapter to prove it will also be Genesis chapter 17. Genesis 17. So it'll be Genesis 17, 21 through 22, where you can find the cross reference supported by those three passages. Now, if your hand is in John 3 and 8, uh, and Hebrews 11 still, so let me finish reading Hebrews 11. Accounting that God was able to raise him up. So Abraham uh, took it. Uh, he, he took it for granted. He accounted that God would resurrect Isaac even from the dead. So even if he offered him up as a sacrifice, Abraham had so much faith by verse 18 that, hey, Isaac, my seed will be called. So I'm going to have children through Isaac. So God is not going to break his word. He's going to resurrect Isaac. Now that's the kind of faith I wonder if you have. If God killed something in your life, took away something in your life, is it so hard for him to resurrect it? You and I don't have that much faith, do we? But Abraham does. Look at the last part of verse 19. From whence also he received him in a figure. So in other words, from Isaac, this is where God was able to, or Abraham, or God, either or, were able to receive from Isaac as a typology, as a figure. Wow. So it's pretty obvious what the author of Hebrews is saying. What is he a figure of? He already g gave it up at verse 17. He gave up where Abraham as a father offered his only begotten son. Now that wording is very strong at John 3, verse 16. We know that verse. <clears throat> For God so loved the world that he what? Gave his only begotten son. That's pretty obvious. It's referring to Jesus Christ. Isaac is a typology of Jesus. I mean, Hebrews 11 even pointed out there is no other verse that mentions it, actually. Only Hebrews 11. The author of Hebrews said that Abraham believed that Isaac, his son, would resurrect from the dead. Why would Hebrews, the author of Hebrews, say that while saying at the same time that uh, the father gave up his only begotten son while saying at the same time Isaac is a figure or a typology unless... He's deliberately trying to point out that Isaac is a typology of Jesus Christ. See, there's no doubt about it. That's pretty clear to me. We go to John 8. John 8. Notice that Jesus Christ even pointed that out. He said that Abraham saw his day. Why, how can Abraham see Jesus Christ at his day unless the only thing that you can find is referring to that day when Abraham offered up his only begotten son Isaac, and that was the typology that Abraham saw, was Jesus Christ. Go to John chapter 8. John chapter 8. We see right here at verse 56, your, your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. How about that? When did that ever happen? 
That's got to be referring to Genesis 22. But I believe Abraham did see it, that it is Genesis 22, because real quick, go to Genesis 22. I wasn't planning on this. But uh, I taught it to you in our uh, Genesis study. So let's go to Genesis 22. And let me do this uh, briefly. Notice what Abraham said at verse 14. He saw something there. He saw Jesus Christ. Genesis twenty-two fourteen, 14. And Abraham called the name of that place where he offered his only begotten son Isaac, Jehovah Jireh. Why? What does it mean? As it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord, it shall be seen. How about that? That particular day, yeah. he saw something. Amen. That's why Jesus Christ said, your father Abraham saw my day yeah, right. and was glad. Amen. See, there was something going on there. There was no doubt it's got to be Genesis 22. All right, let's go back to Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11. I'm surprised how much time I'm spending on this. I didn't even come to uh, my favorite parts here. <laughs> so let's... I'll cover briefly, all right, and then we'll call it a night, okay? So I'll cover it uh, briefly as I can. Let me go on this side a bit because I'm going to draw. Uh, the two parts that you're going to receive a blessing is verse 20 and 21, and I'll add that and we'll call it a night. This is the one I really want to cover concerning your topic on faith. It's supposed to be strong, but what you're going to find out from these two so-called heroes of the faith and I say that so-called in my fleshly feeling because you're going to find out that those people aren't really men full of faith. But God called it an act of faith. And that might encourage you. Verse 20, verse 20. By faith Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau concerning things to come. Okay, so this verse said that Isaac had faith when he blessed Jacob and Esau about what? things that would happen to them. He believed in that. Uh, no, he yeah. did. When you go to Genesis, he doubted. Go to Genesis. He doubted. Go to the book of Genesis. Chapter 27. Notice he was doubting when he gave the blessing. He wasn't full of faith. Go to the book of Genesis chapter 27. And then notice how many times Isaac was doubting it when he gave the blessing to Jacob. He points out right here at verse uh, 26. 26. Well, and his father Isaac said unto him, Come near now and kiss me, my son. And he came near and kissed him, and he smelled the smell of his raiment and blessed him, and said, See, the smell of my son is as the smell of, of, of a field which the Lord hath blessed. Therefore God give thee of the dew of heaven, so he gives a blessing to Jacob. But you'll notice at verse 24, he doubted. He was saying, Are you really Esau? See right here that uh, verse 20, he asks again, how did you find the deer so quick? And then you'll look at verse 22 that, man, that sounds like Jacob. You don't sound like Esau. So there was so much doubt. But notice that when he gave the blessing, the Lord called it faith. Now there's an easy answer to this. The easy answer to this is you don't want to be like some of those dumb commentators. Those dumb commentators will say that, that Isaac was uh, blessing Jacob and they gave some ridiculous explanations for his faith, even though plainly he was doubting. And the Bible says, whatsoever is not a faith is sin. Yeah. So there's a sinful thing going on right here. It's not something that uh, God would approve of. But the simple answer is in verse uh, chapter 28 and verse 3. This is after, after the act was committed. Isaac summoned Jacob again knowing that it's Jacob, and he blessed him at verse 3. See that? Mm -hmm. He blessed him. Yeah. So that's the simple answer. Now there's a second answer to this. If uh, we want to give some leeway, and I'm always open to possibilities, so I always try to do that, even if I disagree with those commentators. If there's any legitimate explanation to chapter 27, then this might be something encouraging to you. The encouraging thing is this. 
Notice that, and we've seen it quite often in our walk. When we have faith in God, it's kind of hard for us to hang on to that faith because doubt keeps slamming in, right? When doubt keeps slamming in, how can we be called a hero of faith? Don't you know that there are those who struggle in their faith, but God still says that they had faith? Uh, we can look at one example. We saw this verse before, but let's go to Romans 4. Romans chapter 4. It's called spiritual growth. Believe it or not, the Lord sees you as a person. The Lord sees you as a person who has strong faith that you can get through it. Even though you don't have much faith on it, God would have faith on that one. Mm -hmm. He would have faith that you have enough faith to go through it in life, if that made any sense to you. That's a very encouraging thing about God, no matter how much doubt floods in your mind. The reason why is there are several explanations why you're still considered to be part of faith, no matter how much doubt creeps into your mind. Several things I'll encourage you is as follows from the life of faith. One is you're holding on to it. What did Hebrews 11 talk about? Embracing, yeah. clinging, holding. As long as you're holding on to it, that shows how very strong you are, not weak. Right. So no matter how much doubt gets in, if, you're, if you keep clinging on to it, the Lord says, yeah, the reason why I knew that you get through it, that you still cling on to it, is because I knew you had that much faith. See, God won't give you a temptation greater than you can bear, right? Number two, notice right here at Romans chapter 4, and we saw this earlier, but let's uh, read it again. In verse 18, in verse 18, who against hope believed in hope? Verse 19, and being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead when he was about an hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God and being fully persuaded that what he had promised he was able also to perform. Now, do you see this uh, graduation here? Look at verse 18. You have no hope, but you choose to have hope. Yeah. Then verse 19, the faith is not weak. weak. Yeah. But notice it's not strong here. See that? Mm -hmm. So in other words, you do have a weak level of faith, but it's not as weak in the sense as verse 18 here. So it's a, at least a small faith. So growth, it's a growing faith. See that? The next part, notice the next part is strong in faith. See that? The next verse, it says strong in faith. Mm -hmm. Then look at the next verse, it says fully persuaded. Yeah. So no matter how much doubt gets into your mind, God can still consider you as a hero of faith. Wow. That's good. Your Why? Because of that growing process. Here's a third thing which can be very powerful if we're going to give any possibility to that incident where Isaac gave the blessing to Jacob when Jacob deceived him. You'll notice in that verse that Isaac, he was confirming that uh, believing when he was giving the promise, but at the beginning he was in doubt. So in other words, while you're in doubt, there are things you can see to choose to have faith in. So for examples, I don't have faith that my finances is going to get better, all right? Now, when I look at that paper and the bill due date is getting closer and closer, man, there's so much doubt in my mind. But when I look at his verse, my God shall supply all your need, I believe in that. Even though my flesh does not believe that he's going to financially provide when I look at that paper. See, that, that's a contradiction of flesh and spirit. So what's going on right here? There still is something in me that chooses to believe, and that is what? 
the things that I'm able to believe in, the Word of God. My God shall supply all your need, not the bill, the paper that I see. See, that's why there's that battle going on. So in the midst of doubt, believe it or not, even though you might think of yourself weak in the faith or doubtful, there are things in there that you have that you choose to believe in, that you have faith in. Otherwise, you wouldn't have made the decision to continue on with your faith. What is it? There's something in the preaching that convicted you, something in the preaching that you believe in, even though your flesh doesn't believe with the pain and the trial you're going through. So if your faith clings on to something that you're able to believe in, that you know you can believe in, and you only focus on those things in spite of how much doubt is cramming into you, you'll still hold on to God and be considered a hero of faith. Did that make any sense to you or was that deep? Okay, I just want to make sure if you're lost and let me know because that way I can ex explain better. So when we're going through our life of doubt, the point is there are some things in that life of doubt that we do believe in. We believe God is real. We believe his book is true. We believe when he promises that he's going to keep it. So see, because of that, I'm going to focus on only on those things that I have faith in that I'm able to believe in, not the things that I'm doubting in, that I'm afraid about. It's the same thing with Simon Peter, right? Why did Simon Peter fall into the water? He had doubt. He had fear. Why is that? At the beginning, he had faith. Lord, let me walk on the water. He had that much faith. Why? Because he believed in Jesus. He saw Jesus. Jesus is real. He kept his eye on Jesus. But once he kept his eyes on the things he doubted, on the things he feared, see the wind and the waves, he sunk. Yeah. So let that encourage you that you can still be a hero of faith no matter how much you think that you're living a life of doubt. Why? Because there are some things in there that you do believe in. We can criticize Peter for living a life of doubt, but a guy who's living a life of doubt would not say at the beginning, Lord, let me come to you out in the water. How can he say something impulsive like that unless he threw out his faith there and believed? See, there's a lot of faith in you that you'd be surprised. You think that your life is filled with doubt, but you'd be surprised you have a life full of faith in there. So that's something really good. Now, the other one is even better. That's yeah. carnality interfering, and we'll cover that next time, okay? We cannot cover tonight, but this one is... Probably even better, maybe, all right? You'd be surprised. You'd be surprised what God would put in the hero of faith here. And that let, that, let their lives encourage your life as you walk in a life full of faith in the Lord. Father God, I pray that tonight's teaching was a blessing to the hearers. Help us to all go home safely. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.